Okay, so I've chosen a provocative title for this Ukraine Explainer video, and the, the title is, Is Russia Fascist? Uh, and, and this is a, a video that talks less about the current conflict in Ukraine than most of the others, but I, I want to be clear at the outset, the questions are very closely connected, and hopefully that will become um, apparent. So the question is, um, is, is Russia fascist? Throughout this conflict, uh, Vladimir Putin has justified his invasion of Ukraine with references to various kinds of fascists in, in Kiev and in some of the other videos. I think I've more or less debunked those claims. Um, but we haven't talked much about the, the idea that Russia is fascist. And I'm not the first person to ask the question. My uh, friend and colleague uh, at George Washington University, Marlene LaRuelle, has, has written a book uh, published last year called Is Russia Fascist? Um, and I'll just I'll just give you give you uh, her view of things a year ago is that is that fascism is is a weapon it's a charge it's a propagandistic term that is thrown back and forth um, and she ends up concluding that Russia is not really fascist. Her book was published last year um, and I haven't had a question to ask her what she thinks about this now. But in any event, I want to take it on 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 my terms because I think it's an important question to ask. What kind of Russian uh, what kind of Russia are we dealing with? Uh, not only as it relates to this war in Ukraine. But, but in the future. Um, so uh, one place where I agree with Laura Well is that fascism is such a vague term that it's hard to say. Um, it is generally used more as an insult than as an analytical political science term, and, and we should bear that in mind. Um, but I would say this, that whatever it is that we think fascism means, and I'm going to talk about that, um, Russia looks a lot more like it than it did a year ago. And I think that's uh, deeply concerning. So what is fascism? Fascism is a political ideology that was very prominent in the um, early 20th century, the 1920s and 30s, in particular leading up to World War II. I think there were three major examples of countries that adopted fascism as a ruling ideology, namely Hitler under Mussolini, which was really the first and the forerunner of the others, uh, Germany under Hitler and the Nazis, and then Spain under Francisco Franco. And that regime was in power um, all the way uh, from 1939 all the way until 1975. Uh, partly because it didn't participate in World War II and so wasn't defeated. But I should note that there were fascist movements in many other countries, including in one way or another in most of the countries of Europe and in the United States uh, during the 1920s and 30s. Um, well, what was the ideology? Uh, one of the reasons why it's hard to nail down what is fascism is that there was no single uh, ideolo uh, ideologist of fascism, nor single any single canonical text in fascism, the way that that communists might point to the writings of Marx. Um, so there's no clear definition. And in the, the, the cases that we have, um, Germany, Italy, Spain, there were enough differences in what they did and what they said and what those leaders espoused that, it, that it's um, hard to exactly nail it down. That being said, I'm going to give it a try, and I think we can point to some um, common defining characteristics of fascism. Um, the first is ultranationalism. Um, and not just ultranationalism, but a particular notion that the state is a single organic entity and, and that the individual is really only important as part of a nation. Um, and I should really say not just the state as an organic ent entity, but the nation as an organic entity and the state as its representative. Um, the, the word fascism comes from this notion of, of fasces, which is um, basically a bundle of sticks, but a particular... Uh, in Roman, uh, it's a Latin word, but uh, the Romans had this idea of an axe whose handle was a bundle of sticks. And the idea being this was a weapon that was made much stronger because rather than having just one uh, piece of wood for a handle, one thick piece of wood, it was built up of these many sticks. And so it was a metaphor or a symbol of the idea that the many have great power together, strength and unity. Um, so, so that was this idea of the, the nation as an organic whole um, and, and as uh, this idea of a, of a weapon. Um, so this aggressive, this aggressive nationalism, I mean, I should say it wasn't just strong nationalism, it was aggressive nationalism, believed in the inferior, inferiority of other groups, right? It's a nationalism that says we're superior to others, not just that we're awesome. Um, and therefore, of course, a willingness to conquer these other groups, which leads fairly directly to the ideology of the Holocaust. Um, but aggressive nationalism led to a, a second key, key trait, which was the embrace of violence, both domestically and internationally. 
I think it's important to recognize that these movements um, came to power domestically through violence, um, although also uh, with some electoral politics, particularly in Germany. Um, and Italy and Germany sought expansion uh, abroad uh, as an expression of that nationalism. Although it's important to point out that Spain did not. Spain stayed neutral in World War II um, and, and really didn't go around starting wars and trying to expand. Um, a, a third, I think I'm up to three, key belief of, of and, and really one of the defining factors of fascism, I think, was its, its notion that liberal democracy uh, was decadent, it was a spent force, and it was on its way out. Right? So, so the, um, the Germans replaced it with this idea of national socialism. Um, as opposed to the international socialism of the Soviets, this was a national socialism. So that the, uh, the economy would largely be controlled by the state, um, but, but not in the service of all mankind, but in the service of the German nation. Um, this then leads to or embraces authoritarianism or even what we would call totalitarianism in which the state increasingly uh, takes on and controls all aspects of people's lives. Uh, and again, it, 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 to some extent, this notion of the decadence of liberal democracy grows out of the experience of, of the post-World War I era in Europe in particular, but also in the United States where um, capitalism seemed to be um, uh, failing, there was worldwide depression, um, and liberal democratic governments seemed utterly unequipped um, to deal in, with what they were facing. Um, lastly, and, and this is one of the really important things, I think, was that the fascists of the early 20th century um, all believed in a utopian future. Um, Hitler talked about his thousand-year Reich, and if you look at the art and architecture and film of, of the fascists of that era, it was about this idea that they were building uh, a great future. Um, and they were actually very excited about futurism, and you see that in the art. There were all these sort of super fu futuristic ideas of what the architecture was going to look like and super fast motor vehicles and things like this. Um, so that's an important context as well, the idea that we're doing all this stuff, we're, we're waging this intense violence, and we're doing it in the cause uh, of a great uh, future that, that, that uh, merits the violence that we're waging. So if we look at Russia today, we see a lot of this, right? But not necessarily all of it. Um, we see the nationalism. And we, not, not, not just nationalism, but it's getting increasingly strong, right? Russia is not just a nation and a unified nation. Um, Putin talks about people who go against the nation in Russia as traitors. And he says, you know, you know what we do with traitors. Um, but it's not just a nation, it's a nation on a mission. It's on a religious mission to lead the Orthodox world, um, and it's on a mission to push back on what he sees as the corrupt values of the West and the overbearingness of the United States. And I have to say, one, uh, in terms of nationalism, one recent site that really, I have to say, startled me, took me aback, and one of the reasons why I decided to make this video, um, was, was Putin's rally uh, at Luzhniki Stadium in Moscow. Um, so here you saw 80,000 people in a stadium being whipped into a sort of nationalist, militarist frenzy. And I said to myself, oh, you know, I've seen the films, the videos of these rallies that um, Hitler, uh, you know, held, uh, the rallies at, at Nuremberg. And I thought, ah, this, this is a little, you know, not exactly the same thing, but, but it's a little too close for comfort. Um, and of course, with Russia's wars, we see the turning of nationalist aggression uh, into violence. And it's equally important, however, I think that's obvious to us, the, the violence in Ukraine, but it's equally, in a lot of other places, it's equally uh, important to recognize that Putin came to power uh, in many ways linked to violence. He came to power on the backs of a, of a war in Chechnya, which was exceedingly violent, and on some very suspicious terrorist incidents in Russia uh, that were used to justify not only the uh, sort of the need for a strong leader like Putin, but, but specifically a clampdown on, on opposition and on a free press. And of course, we have consistently seen um, violence in the murder of, of key opponents. Uh, we also see this notion that liberal democracy and capitalism are decadent. Putin, Putin is contemptuous of liberal democracy. He sees it as a plot to weaken Russia. Um, and he believes that only an authoritarian Russia can be a strong Russia. And that, too, has its echoes with the fascists of the 1930s. He rails against the West's toleran West tolerance of women's rights, gay rights, and so on. Um, 
And he's made it a priority then that, that even as business remains largely in private hands, right, business serves the interests of the states and so that's of the state. And that's sort of a, an idea that's antithetical to, to what we think of in a liberal economy, a capitalist economy. Um, finally, I would say it's clear that with the invasion of Ukraine, Russia has become a much more tightly authoritarian state. Uh, it's tightened control dramatically over what cannot be said. Um, and, and now we see this kind of control that's um, what must be said. A lot of people, prominent Russians, have found themselves under pressure to, to come out and, and speak in favor of this war, although some of it do it quite voluntarily. And, and this is a slightly separate question, um, but I do think it's worth mentioning. Um, you see this sort of in this, in this rally at Luzhniki Stadium. There are a lot of Russians, average Russians, who are very enthusiastic about this, although gauging exactly what proportion that is is quite difficult. Um, so all of that looks pretty similar. Um, all of those look like sort of echoes of 1930s fascism in Russia today. Um, but there are some respects that I don't think uh, um, echo so clearly, and we should keep them in mind as well. Um, one is this notion of a utopian future. Um, Putin is not pursuing a utopian future. His promise is not of some golden age, uh, or at least a golden age in the future. Rather, he wants to return to a golden age of the past. Um, a past if, if which it was not utopian in any sense, um, at least achieved the ideal of Russia as a power that was a global power, um, a European power, um, and was uh, feared by all. Um, and so I think that's an important difference between the, the fascist movements of the 30s um, and today, is this idea that, they're, that the, the, um, the violence is justified to build this great future. Um, all, all Putin is trying to do, actually, in fact, is the opposite, is to turn back the clock. Um, and lastly, um, or secondly, uh, is fascism, fascism as an ideology. The fascists of the 20s and 30s identified as fascists, uh, and they were proud to do so. They believed in fascism. They wrote fascist tracts, and uh, enough of them um, that, you know, again, it's, it's hard to say exactly what fascism means. So fascism in the 1930s was, uh, and, and afterwards, was not just a practice, right? It was an ideology. It was a body of thought, even if not an entirely coherent body of thought. Um, and for all of the behavior that looks similar, Putin does not advocate fascism. Of course, um, it's a key part of the Russian uh, nationalist um, identity that Russia is an anti-fascist country, right? Because, because Russia still derives immense pride uh, from the fact that, that it played, or that the Soviet Union, of which Russia was a part, and of course Russia sometimes conflates that, um, played this incredibly powerful and important role in defeating fascism um, in the 1940s in World War II, and paid such a high price for doing so. Um, so. So Russia today still thinks of itself not only as not a fascist country, but as an anti-fascist country. Though it's worth pointing out that there are some ideologists in Russia, both in the past and in the present, who look a lot like, um, or sound a lot like, fascists. Uh, you might point to the politician Vladimir Zhirinovsky, Zier, uh, um, who's represented in the, in the Russian parliament. Um, others have pointed to Putin's apparent fondness for the 20th century Russian nationalist thinker Ivan Ilyin, um, who some identify as fascist, but others do not, getting back to this idea that it's, it's hard to pin it down. Um, so ultimately, um, there is no clear definition of fascism, and so one cannot definitively answer the question. Uh, moreover, uh, I think the question itself is more important um, because of the emotions that that word fascism evokes than of the specific definition or any conclusion uh, we, we get to. I think Laura Well is right that, that fascism is a word that at this point in time is, is more effective as a sort of a, a invective to, to hurl at somebody than it is um, as a, a category that we can really use analytically with any kind of precision. Uh, that being said, I think the discussion is still worth having because it, it's, as, as I've tried to do in this uh, uh, short lecture, um, illustrate something that's quite that I think is quite clear, which is that regardless of what we call it um, specifically or what label we put on it, Russia is increasingly nationalist. It's increasingly violent. It's increasingly aggressive. Um, increasingly authoritarian and increasingly rejects sort of the, the liberal democratic uh, model that is generally associated with Western Europe, the United States, and, and actually a, a big part of the world as well, you know, Japan, Korea, but a lot of the rest of the world as well. Um, so those things, I think, are, are cause for immense concern 
uh, regardless of what label we stick on it.